Welcome to Matters Financial and Geopolitical from a Frontier. Thank you for stopping by. Um, I hope the week's gone well. Don't forget we're at Main Speak at the Intercontinental tomorrow from 9.30 a.m. when we serve breakfast. It's a free-to-attend forum. And we're and I'm hosting Sumeya Hassan Atmani, who is the Chief Executive Officer of the National Oil Corporation of Kenya. Um, had a really interesting conversation with her yesterday. Knows all her forward curves, has a great uh, finger on the pulse of the oil and gas industry. So I'm looking forward to that and uh, urge you to come. She comes from Malindi, she was telling me, and I was reminding her of the halwa shop that we used to drive up to on a Sunday from Mombasa. And we'd start, we'd arrive there, we'd have our halwa, and then we'd wander off for a swim. And we really enjoyed ourselves. My dad had some great friends and clients. Um, but getting back to Samaya, looking forward to that, um, and uh, hope to see you at Mindspeak. What is Mindspeak is a link that's up there and also a link for the, the, the sessions we've had since we started years ago. I'd like to thank Roxanne de Bilderling, who is the uh, ambassador, Belgium amb Belgian ambassador to Kenya. Fabulous lunch yesterday, fabulous gourmet cuisine, gourmet company and gourmet conversation. Um, lots of interesting people, I must say, very eclectic crowd. Um, and uh, thoroughly enjoy it. Thank you. And the food was delicious, and it turns out Roxanne's husband's a bit of a chef. Macro thoughts, it was Mario Draghi time yesterday, wasn't it? Have a look at the Euro chart, uh, and what happened when he started speaking and talking about more stimulus. Um, and the Euro now, most of the commercial banks I see are talking about a fresh 2015 low. Um, Home thoughts, the rains came last night pretty heavily here in Nairobi and everywhere I turn I hear people asking, is that the El Nino? Um, we were up in Burano over the weekend and there were some dark storm clouds gathering and there was a wonderful rainbow, I'll put up a photograph of that. Thoroughly enjoyed reading Jonathan Franzen's The Corrections, it's an older novel of his, uh, which I hadn't read and uh, I must say it was excellent. Um, I came across uh, a review in the London Review of Books today, there are only second acts in American lives, no generation to find itself interestingly lost in Paris, no elegant tribe crowding the lawn with portents of disaster at Gatsby's parties, no collective urge to write the great war novel, no second sex to judge by the best of the new setting. Uh, to, sorry, to judge by the best of the new writing, the most urgent of the new films, the most watched television, American lives are now devoted to a wholesale inhabiting of the dead afternoon. There is limbo, there is status, there is mild domestic psychosis. Um, and then saying, and in these lives and in the books and films that venture to look at these lives, you notice how a single powerful question pertains what now. Two uh, pieces from that book. So this is Gitan turning to Chip. Chip is, has run out of money, has got involved with Gitan, is a Lithuanian politician stroke, um, I don't know what you call him, Ponzi scheme artiste, um, and uh, who's been in prison a few times. Gitan turning to Chip. So what you got? Cigarette burns too? And Chip showed his palm. It's nothing. Self-inflicted, you pathetic American, Jutan said. Different kind of prison, Chip said. I thought that was quite powerful. And this is the second. And when the event, the big change in your life is simply an insight, isn't that a strange thing? That absolutely nothing changes except that you see things differently and you're less fearful, less anxious, and generally stronger as a result? Isn't it amazing? that a completely invisible thing in your head can feel realer than anything you've ever experienced before. You see things more clearly and you know that you're seeing them more clearly. And it comes to you that this is what it means to love life. This is all anybody who talks seriously about God is ever talking about moments like this. Political reflections I thought Hillary Clinton showed yesterday why she is such an accomplished 
a politician in that uh, congressional testimony. She really killed it dead, I thought. Put up a photograph of her with, from, from the days when she was campaigning for Bill. Um, I'll also put up a photograph of the US consulate in Benghazi after the compound was stormed by an armed group on September the 11th. Look, the facts are clearly um, that there was some culpability and she recognized this and she eulogized the, the, the folks who died. Really a superb political performance, I thought. Um, Al Jazeera put, put out a tweet, blame it on the Mufti. And I, remember the song the girls kept playing to me by Calvin Harris, Blame. So if you want to listen to Calvin Harris or have a look at Blame It on the Mufti, um, that's of course playing on what Netanyahu had to say. Report US spied on Israel, prepared to destroy Israeli bombers to protect Iran. Since 2012, this is reported in the Jewish press, the United States has been spying on Israel in order to prevent the Jewish state from attacking suspected Iranian nuclear sites, according to Friday's Wall Street Journal. White House had sent an additional aircraft carrier to the region after learning that Israeli aircraft had flown into Iranian airspace in what U.S. officials feared it was a test run for an attack on Iran's Fordo plant. It's interesting. Um, the surprise visit, this is from Bloomberg, shows the world Moscow is firmly on the side of Assad. This is an alliance of two people going toward victory together. And then, um, counterpunch, the real game changer once again has been the show-stopping performance of the 26 caliber NK cruise missiles launched by the Russian Caspian fleet against targets 1,500 kilometers away. And this is Pepe Escobar. Breedlove cannot possibly admit the Caspian cruise missile was directed at NATO. The caliber NK flew over both Iran and Iraq at a maximum altitude of 100 meters. And according to Pepe, this is spelling out the absolute irrelevance of all multi-billion elaborate plans for missile defense deployed in Eastern Europe. Saying that NATO is also terrified that all its state-of-the-art C4I software, command control, communications, computer intelligence, has been totally jammed by Russian technology all across Syria and southern Turkey, essentially reduced to sitting ducks. Put up a photograph of the NK cruise missiles uh, being launched on, by the Russian Navy. Jeb Bush says allowing Iran, Russia, and Syria to advance in the Middle East is neither smart nor powerful. But the point is, you know, with Jeb Bush, everyone used to think of him as the brighter Bush, actually, and he's turned out not to be able to um, play the game of politics at this level because his numbers have just never got anywhere. But maybe he's been trumped by the real Donald. Put up a photograph that uh, I found on Twitter. Russian jamming system blocks all NATO electronics inside bubbles 600 kilometers in diameter over Syria. And as I said previously, this was a massive advance by Vladimir Putin. His timing was extraordinary and he's really become the price set. And you can see that in the calls he makes and in the visits he's getting. The Saudis are learning that money can't buy strategic preeminence just at the point where money threatens to become scarce. That was a good point. International markets, Jamie McGeever, there goes the euro. As Draghi says, ECB will re-examine stimulus in December. Um, and I'm sure this has probably gone lower, but the Swiss 10-year yield yesterday fell to a fresh record low of minus 0.3%. All German yields out to six years of maturity are now negative. Two-year Eurozone bond yield sinks to a record low of minus 0 0.3. So we've had some big moves. And, uh, he's gradually chipping away at any support the Euro might have. We're now at 111, the figure. Um, 111, the figure. The dollar index, 96.28. Japanese yen, 120.48. Swissy, 0.9729. Pound, uh, 153.86. Beginning to fall away a little bit. Aussie. Uh, 0.7262, so that's our bank actually. 
India rupees 64.885, South Korean won 11.2497, the real 3.9049, Egyptian pound which popped over 8 only this week, 8.0322, South African rand when I looked last, 13.36.61, um, Canadian 130.92, I think we're going to be in this 130, 134 range for a while. I think, you know, the market was overly worried about Harper's departure. Dollar index, uh, I'll put up a three-month chart. This move higher has all been about the weaker euro. Euro dollar, let me put up a three-month chart. And most of the uh, commercial banks are now talking about possibility of fresh 2015 lows. Alphabet, formerly Google, sets share buyback shares jump very strong. Technology sector in the U.S. yesterday, probably driven by Google and Microsoft, is at a 15-year high. Google posted very strong bottom, top and bottom line results, frankly. Commodity markets, gold, which I've turned bullish about um, when we were below 11.55, is now at 11.70. My target's 12.25. Crude oil, last trading $48.60. Look, it might float higher on this new stimuli, but then it's going to go back down again. It's still very, very oversupplied. Let's move on to Sub-Saharan Africa. Before I get to Tanzania, you can't talk, I like this sentence, you can't talk about Tanzania without mentioning Mount Kilimanjaro. Standing at 20,000 feet, it is the tallest mountain on the African continent, and the highest freestanding mountain in the world. Three volcanic cones, Mawenzi, Shira and Kibo. Mawenzi and Shira are extinct, but Kibo, the highest peak, is dormant and could erupt again. Almost every kind of ecological system is to be found on the mountain. Cultivated land, rainforest, heath, moorland, alpine desert, and an arctic summit. Let me put up a photograph of the snow peaks of Kilimanjaro I took 510 days ago, and another one I took even longer when we were from the road, and you could actually see Mount Kilimanjaro as we headed to Mombasa. Tanzania bulldozer, this is the CCM candidate Magafuli, faces ex-premier in tightest vote in years. This is Bloomberg. Tanzanians vote Sunday on a successor to President Kikwete, with the ruling party of Africa's third largest gold producer facing its tightest election since independence five decades ago. John Magafuli, he's the CCM candidate, and former Prime Minister Edward Lawasa are the front runners, saying Lawasa has built momentum with mass rallies, savvy use of social media. Magafuli, Magafuli nicknamed the bulldozer because of the zeal he showed in his post of works minister, projects the image of a hard-working man seeking to revitalize the party, which has ruled since 1961. For the first time, we don't know who is going to win, said Alex Awiti, director of the East African Institute at the Abakan University in Nairobi, said by friend. Two September polls saw Magafuli securing more than 60%, while another showed Lawasa winning with just over half the support of Tanzania's electorate. It's a $49 billion agrarian economy growing at around 7%. Some Tanzanians think Kikwete screwed up so much and think Lawasa is a welcome wake up call for the CCM. Um, my conclusions are whoever wins the youth vote wins Tanzania. And going by the social media response, you would say Lawasa's in the lead on that front. But um, I just can't see the CCM uh, losing or giving up power if they lost. A difficult Tanzanian election still represents progress. This is the Economist um, talking about uh, um, a situation. Let me read you the description. Uh, when John Magafuli uh, visits Mwanza, there's a cr crowd, is a sea of green and yellow flags. As they await his arrival, young supporters scream for breakdancing rappers, laugh at raucous comedians, take photos on their mobile phones. How Africa has changed. That one sentence. Um, January Makamba uh, posted this picture of a rally for the incoming president of Tanzania. And then I found this photograph from Al Jazeera, supporters of the CUF party rally in the run-up to Tanzania's close election. Let's move on. This was posted by RFI Congo, 
a de jour du referendum. They're holding a referendum this Sunday. And so you can feel the tension in Brazzaville. Let me put up a photograph of Congo, Republic of Congo President Denis Sassou Nguesso. Um, uh, Congo, uh, basically, uh, he's trying to extend, uh, he's trying to get permission to stand again. Um, and clearly, he's going to do whatever it takes to get that over the line. A referendum on Sunday will determine whether 71-year-old Sassou Nguesso can legally stand for a third consecutive term in next year's election. The president who has ruled for 31 of the past 36 years is currently barred from running on account of both his age and constitutional term limits. This was the subject of a tremendous debate yesterday at lunch because we had all kinds of people. The president's uncle was there, Belgian diplomatic corps, uh, Roxanne's boss, uh, you know, who was previously head of the Africa mission at the Foreign Office, um, a very interesting Algerian gentleman who is the AU's envoy to the Great Lakes region and it's quite a heated debate. EU calls Burundi to talks in Brussels over crisis. This is a last resort, said one EU diplomat. Um, I'll put up a photograph of uh, a cabinet meeting. Uh, it's very complex and it's difficult to work out where this goes, but it's, if you look at the indicators, they're all going south. Zimbabwe's Robert Mugabe awarded China's Nobel Peace Prize. Well, we shall leave it at that. Angola has issued its first euro bond for one and a half billion dollars. <coughs> Very interesting piece <coughs> in Africa Confidential about this hunger strike stirring dissent. Uh, President Jose Eduardo dos Santos' government has remained unmoved as the popular rapper and civil rights activist Luati da Silva Birao's health deteriorate sharply after almost a month on hunger strike in prison. And, uh, you know, this has been this iron fist approach. I don't think it's going to work, but the interesting detail in this was right at the end, second paragraph, with signs of China changing its policy towards Angola. And this is the important point, and I think this is actually happening. Sam Pa was a confidant of Dos Santos, amongst others, uh, has fallen into disrepute. And I think the Chinese are just simply not interested in pumping more cash in because the assumption of Dos Santos is that he's got to do whatever it takes to stay in power, and he will. But why would the Chinese back that? Because at some point, if it tips, it tips big. I wrote about this on the 10th of August 2015 when I said the end is nigh for crude oil and oil producers from Caracas to Luanda from Riyadh to Abuja. Kapuczynski said, if the crowd disperses, goes home, does not reassemble, we say the revolution is over. I was saying the revolution is only just beginning. 21st of September, I said President Eduardo dos Santos is leveraging the balance sheet, drawing down loans to make up the shortfall and stamping down hard on any whisper of dissent. I'll put up a photograph of him with President Xi Jinping. Look at the body language. Bond markets turns against African borrowers as debt costs soar. When Zambia first sold bonds in international markets in 2012, the country got so much demand it could have issued 16 times the $750 million it raised. Fast forward three years to an offering in July the African nation only got twice as many bids for the $1.25 billion on sale. Drop in appetite illustrates the problems besetting much of Africa, where falling prices for commodities from oil to copper are sapping revenues at a time when governments want to boost investment in everything from energy infrastructure to schools and hospitals. Ghana this month became only the fourth country in the past decade to issue a euro bond at yields above 10%. Zambia earlier joined other six other countries that sold debt at rates higher than 9% since 2010. These are really high yields. It's undoubtedly become a lot tougher for them. The market has become more nervous about the prospects for many of these African countries. Two years ago, with the outlook for emerging markets still rosy, money was cheaper. In July 2013, Ghana sold 10-year bonds at 8%. Zambia paid 5.63% compared with 9.38% for the latest deals. Issuance from the region has fallen 
uh, from 2014. Um, and then going through, obviously, Zambia is the most tricky one. Talking about what, the fact that, you know, they, they, the recurrent expenditure component is the Achilles heel. Ghana and Zambia face a mountain climb to stabilize public debt. And have a look. I'm going to put up uh, an image of the movement in African currencies. And only the Somalia currency and the Gambian currency, incredibly, have improved against the dollar this year. Um, and this is the point I've been making. The story around the Kenya shilling is not as bad when you put it in this kind of picture that you're seeing now, hopefully. Um, I like this photograph from the AFP, fees must fall. This is a big situation down in South Africa. And, uh, you know, it might well mark a tipping point moment when the, uh, you know, when people, when, when you find that the ANC gets challenged uh, and challenged big. I think that challenge is now in play. South African oil shares up 7.08% here today. That's all about Sam Miller. Dollar Rand, I'll put up a six month chart. Bit of a bounce here, moved very dramatically in the previous session. Egyptian pound above eight, as I said. Egyptian EGX 30 down 14.74% year to date. Nigeria oil share down 13.36% year to date. Ghana Stock Exchange Composite Index down 12.08% year to date. Everything down, as you can see, in South Africa. This photograph by Brent Sturton. Rangers and locals carry the body of a mountain gorilla killed in Virunga National Park in 2007. The IMF have published a letter that was written to them by the Central Bank Governor and by the Cabinet Secretary for Treasury. Plenty of detail in there. Do have a look at it. The links on rich wrap ups. Scroll down to Kenya, first story. Current level, yeah, there's plenty of uh, 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 this stuck out. Performance under our economic program supported by the standby arrangement. The standby credit facility arrangement has been broadly in line with program targets. We met all quantitative performance criteria and indicative targets under the program through end March 2015 with the exception of temporary delays in the repayment of some external obligations. That's called a default. Resulting in the non-observance of the continuous performance criterion on external arrears, these obligations were fully settled and we have taken corrective measures to avoid any recurrence of such delays. The Treasury has been queried over a secret US bank account where proceeds from this euro bond apparently were kept. Uh, after a deduction uh, for the repayment of a loan which had been taken out. Um, the Treasury has been asked to explain the interest earned from a secret government-owned New York account that held proceeds of the $2 billion euro bond. The Public Accounts Committee wants to know how much interest was earned from the account and who its beneficiaries were, as well as the expenditure audit, expenditure audit of the euro Jubilee Insurance maintains market lead with 12.6% of revenue. This is data from the Insurance Regulatory Authority. Um, Jubilee's market share stood at 12.6%. Uh, interestingly, uh, Britam Real Insurance at 11.5%. Newly merged UAP Old Mutual ranked fifth. There's a link for Jubilee Insurance and share price data. Trading on a trading PE of 8.375. Kenya Shilling around the 102 level. Nairobi all share at a one week high, up, uh, sorry, down 14.4% year to date. NSE 20 similarly at a one week high, but down 23.02% year to date. If there's any share, share you want to look into, there's a link on the, on the website. Let me leave you with this tweet from Iwaso Lions. Finally, water in the Iwaso Nero River after months of being dry. So, is it El Nino? Well, we'll have to find out. And if not, uh, well, so anyways, finally, final point, sorry, is uh, Mindspeak tomorrow. See you then.